without further ado, Dr. Lewis is um, just a couple days left in his training, <laughs> and then he'll be formally trained as a um, hematologist, and uh, unfortunately for us, is going to warmer climes, although I don't know how much warmer it can get than it's been here <laughs> lately. Um, but Dr. Mark Lewis is a fantastic young um, physician with a real expertise in MEM. Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Well, good morning. Um, I'm so happy to welcome you here to this seminar. As Dr. Farley said, I'm a fellow here at Mayo in hematology and medical oncology. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of American Multiple Endocrine Neoplasia Support. So on both counts, I extend you the warmest welcome. Um, for such a rare disease, it's a real thrill to see people gathered together uh, for a common purpose. And I suspect that your purpose in being here is to gain information. And the last thing I want to do with this uh, introductory lecture is to uh, offend you or patronize you. Uh, Linda asked me to start off today by explaining the very basics of MEN type 1. I will touch very briefly on types 2, uh, 2B, and 4. Uh, but you're here probably to learn about MEN1. And we live in the information age where any internet search can bring you facts or what might appear to be facts. And the problem is that not all sources of information are reputable. So I realize that you're probably resourceful and every patient is their own best advocate. And many of these things you've probably read before. But I thought I would try to condense down in one single lecture uh, the very basics of MEN1 and essentially provide the framework for all the other lectures that will come later today. Uh, if ever there was a disease that requires multiple medical and surgical disciplines to manage it, this is it. Uh, almost every MEN1 patient needs an endocrinologist, and then at various stages in the course of the disease, uh, it needs involvement of different surgical disciplines, uh, such as endocrine surgery, general surgery, neurosurgery, and sometimes also involves my field, which is medical oncology. So to get us started, we have to begin at the beginning. So it was almost 50 years ago <coughs> This paper came out in the American Journal of Medicine by a New York physician called Dr. Wormer. And what Dr. Wormer did was he identified a pattern, and that pattern was multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. And this was such a seminal uh, discovery that for many years, MEN1 was actually known by the eponym Wormer's syndrome. But we have to go back even farther than that. At the beginning of the last century, there were these first reports emerging of humans having multiple growths, not necessarily cancers, but growths in their endocrine glands. And you have to realize that back then our ability to look inside the human body was quite limited. We didn't have the advanced imaging techniques that we have today. So a lot of these observations were being made either at the time of surgery or postmortem on autopsies. So at the beginning of the last century, this is what they were noticing. Over the next 50 years, there were more and more reports of the same person having growths in multiple endocrine glands and interesting, some of this was also coming from the veterinary literature. The vets were noticing this was happening in dogs. And, you know, we don't always communicate very well with our colleagues in veterinary medicine, but sometimes there's a, there's a shared knowledge there. And then, in 1954, it was Dr. Wormer who really made the key observation that this was happening in families. This could be an inherited condition. And again, I think the reason this condition is so emotionally resonant with, with many of us is the fact that uh, it is something that can be passed from, from generation to generation. And the first family he described were actually immigrants uh, from Italy. And as Linda mentioned earlier, a lot of the, the really important work um, in MEN1 has been done and is being done in Italy. And what he observed was that there was a father and then four of his daughters who were having a really terrible time with stomach ulcers. These, these ulcers were awful. They resulted in significant abdominal pain and bleeding. And as he examined and explored the rest of the family, not all directly, but by report of the patients themselves, <coughs> he noticed that there was a tendency for them to have high calcium levels kidney stones, growths in the pituitary gland, tumors in the pancreas, and then what was most troubling was these stomach ulcers were so bad that patients were actually dying either from uncontrollable bleeding or for the, the ulcer actually rupturing, for it breaking through the wall of the stomach. So this is what's called a family pedigree, and you're going to have lectures later today by trained geneticists, and I'm certainly not one of those. But the way I can explain this to you very simply is it's essentially an inverted family tree, where up at the top, you have the oldest generation and all their descendants fanning out below them. And each square represents a man, uh, and each circle represents a woman, and a line between them means that they had children. So what you can see represented here is actually five different gener gen generations uh, successively. And the, the first group I was describing to you just now, the father, 
and his four daughters are all represented right here. Okay. So as you step back and look at this, there's a couple of different observations that, that can strike you. One of which is, if you counted them up, there's roughly 40 people represented on this pedigree. And what Dr. Wormer did was he colored in, in black or in hatched gray, if he thought they were affected by MEN1. And if you count them up, there's actually 20 such people on this slide. So 20 out of 40, you get the sense that, okay, there's roughly half of the family is affected by this disease. The other thing that you'll notice is that since circles are women and uh, squares are men, it's not affecting one gender or the other. It's affecting both genders. We see some inherited conditions that have a very strong gender linkage. Usually it'll affect men and not women because of the way the sex chromosomes are oriented. But this is clearly a condition that can affect either gender. And the other thing that's really striking is the black coloring represents people that had stomach ulcers. So of all the people that were affected, almost all of them had a stomach ulcer. The cross-hatched gray were people that also had gross in their endocrine glands. And so this is the pattern that Dr. Wormer re uh, recognized, and that's the reason he gets so much credit for the discovery of this syndrome, because you can imagine this took a lot of work, took a lot of investigation, and it may seem obvious to, now, uh, to us in retrospect, but this was, this was really, I think, a seminal finding. So the three Ps of MEN1 that have been drilled into medical students ever since our involvement of the pituitary gland, which sits at the base of the brain, the parathyroid gland, which is at the lower neck, and then the pancreas. And I assure you that almost everyone going through medical school these days has heard about this. The problem is, do they remember it later in their practice? Okay. I'm seeing a lot of head shaking, no. And, and the issue is this. So in medical school, you have to understand our training. We're exposed to a tremendous body of knowledge, and our faculties do their best to give us access to all these different conditions, some of which we may never actually encounter in our work. And during residency, we're actually encouraged when we're coming up with different ideas about diagnoses that when we hear hoofbeats, we should be thinking horses and not zebras. And what that means is that common things are common. So when I went through my residency, I treated dozens, literally dozens of people with congestive heart failure, diabetes, emphysema. I don't think I encountered one MEN1 patient during my entire residency doesn't mean I shouldn't have been thinking about it, but just the way our minds work and these mental patterns we get into, you know, things that are more rare or exotic just tend to fall off the radar. So again, every, every doctor in America should have heard about this, whether it's part of their active thought process when they're encountering patients is, I think, more of a question. Uh, but there's a built-in mnemonic here, which is really nice, and this is the reason this condition, I can assure you, comes up on a lot of tests, it comes up on board exams and school uh, tests in medical school, and it's because of the three Ps. So all these organs start with the same letter, and they're all neatly aligned in the midline of the body, pituitary, parathyroid, and pancreas. So actually, it, it, it's pretty easy to remember if you want to take the effort to do so. The questionable fourth P is peptic ulcers. So I showed you that in Dr. Wormer's initial paper, he was really concerned about the incidence of peptic ulcers. So why isn't that included with the other three Ps? Well, his group, 19 of 20 patients, had these stomach ulcers. And the reason they probably did, although I can't go back and prove this to you, is that it was actually pancreatic tumors, so that third P, overproducing a hormone called gastrin, which leads to overproduction of stomach acid, and that in turn leads to the stomach ulcers. So in a way, the fourth P is already wrapped into the third P, because it's the pancreatic tumors in general that are resulting in these peptic or stomach ulcers. Well, why is it so hard to pick out uh, a family or a person that has MEN1? And one word I want you to be familiar with, even though you may think it's jargon at first, is this word penetrance. And this is an important um, concept in genetics. And what it really means is that even if people share the same gene, different proportions of them will show symptoms from that gene. So the gene doesn't necessarily affect everyone universally or at the same time. A tricky thing about MEN1 is that most patients don't become symptomatic from it until they're in their 30s. I think the earliest reported case of someone being symptomatic from MEN1 was a five-year-old who was having problems with high calcium. So many patients have already uh, gotten married and started having children uh, before they know that they have MEN1. And that's a good thing because it tells us that the disease itself doesn't significantly limit lifespans. There's other genetic conditions that would prevent people from being able to reproduce. And thankfully, MEN1 is not, is not one of them, in, in, generally speaking. But the, the hard part about this is that MEN1 patients can still look different. 
By the age of 50, over 90% of MEMI patients will have given some sign or symptom that they have the condition. But even then, there's a small fraction of people that will be completely silent. And by silent, I mean either they don't recognize that they have the symptom, or they don't express the symptom to their doctor, or their doctor knows about the symptom, but doesn't realize it's connected to this condition. The other thing that's responsible for MEN1 patients looking different is that depending on which hormone is being affected and whether it's being produced too much or too little, the patient will present differently. And in Wormer's original paper, he gets credit for this. He says, the clinical picture of the syndrome reflects the functional state of the hormonal glands. The adenomas, meaning the growths, may be secretory and releasing hormone, or they may be non-secretory. In fact, they can even suppress hormone production. So this is the reason why we've got a lot of MEN1 patients gathered in this room. And I imagine if you compared stories, none of you would have a presentation that was exactly alike. And it's because of the concepts of penetrance and also because there's such variation in the hormone production. So let's talk about each one of the three glands uh, in series. And you're going to have uh, a lecture shortly from uh, a pituitary surgeon. But the pituitary gland sits right at the base of the brain. And if you imagine going straight back between your eyes, it's actually a sinus back there. So you've got your frontal sinuses up here, your maxillary sinuses here, and then back between your eyes, you have something called the sphenoid sinuses. And right behind that, there's a little uh, notch in the base of the skull bone called the Turkish saddle, or the cella tersica. There's a lot of Latin and Greek terminology in medicine. So when they were first examining the skull, they noticed there was this little divot at the bottom. And the reason that divot's important is that the pituitary gland so it's right in there. So if you look at the brain front ways, this is the pituitary right here. If you look at it sideways, this is that Turkish saddle. And it sits in that little bony notch uh, right at the base of the skull. And the whole rest of the brain is on top of it. The reason that location is so important is that the human skull is absolutely amazing. And it contains the most complex machine on Earth, which is our, which is our mind. But there's also very valuable real estate up there and not a lot of space for things that aren't supposed to be there. So oftentimes, if the pituitary gets a, a growth or a tumor in it that starts pushing on the brain, patients will have headaches. The brain is covered by this actually surprisingly resilient uh, lining called the dura. But if you push on it, it can be extremely sore. So patients will often uh, present with headaches. But you know, headaches are pretty common. Like I said before, when you're trying to sort out your horses and your zebras, if you think every patient in your clinic with a headache has MEN1, you're going to be wrong most of the time. The other thing that can happen is that the nerves that control the information going from your eyes to the back of your brain pass right above the pituitary gland. So as the pituitary uh, gland has a growth in it that grows, it can actually push up on those nerves, the optic nerves, right as they cross. So one thing that's interesting is that your, your brain and your eyes are sort of backwards in that the information from your left eye ends up back in the right lobe of your brain and vice versa. And it's actually right as those signals are crossing called the chiasm, it's right above the pituitary gland. So as that growth comes up and pushes on that crossover point, you get a very interesting pattern of visual loss, which I'll show you later. So visual symptoms can be another sign that there's a problem inside the pituitary. And then the pituitary is really the master gland for the whole endocrine system. So the example that's used a lot, this is not an original metaphor for me, is the thermostat in your house. Okay, So if, if your house is warm, as it might be at the moment, and you set your air conditioner to come on, what's going to happen is your thermostat is going to tell your air conditioner to keep putting out cold air, and it's going to keep sampling the temperature of the air in your house until it's at the right level. Essentially, the pituitary gland helps you do the same thing in your body. So it senses how much hormone is already out in the system, and it adjusts its regulatory signals to make sure that that hormone ends up at the right level. So it releases something called thyroid-stimulating hormone, which is a wonderful name because it says exactly what it does. It tells the thyroid what to do. It also is responsible for the stress hormones. So it releases a chemical, chemical called ACTH, which goes down to your adrenal glands and releases the stress hormone cortisol. It's responsible for growth hormone, which is primarily important in childhood and adolescence when our, our bones are growing. It's actually responsible for breast milk production uh, through a chemical called prolactin. And then it's also responsible for signals that go to our reproductive organs. And this is true for both men and women. Although the names of these suggest that they were discovered first in women. So there's luteinizing and follicle stimulating uh, hormone. So those are signals that go to the ovary. But they're also important in going to the testes in men. So how do you know if these hormones are being disrupted? Well, if you have too much 
thyroid stimulating hormone, you end up with a condition called hyperthyroidism. And this is essentially like your whole metabolism has been revved up. And one of the key signs of this is weight loss. Now a lot of people say, oh gosh, that sounds wonderful, I'd love to lose weight. But I can assure you this is not the way that you want to lose weight. This is, it can be very, very uncomfortable for patients to say the least. You can feel like your heart is racing, you're having palpitations. You can actually go into an abnormal heart rhythm. You can have a lot of diarrhea. Your skin can get very thin and fragile. Your hair may even fall out. So th there are significant um, prices to pay for that weight loss. Having too much ACTH ends up with something called Cushing's disease, and this has a very characteristic appearance. That stress hormone, uh, over time, not only interferes with your ability to control your blood sugar, it also leads to fat deposition in different parts of the body. Uh, particularly centrally, it leads to fat deposition. It leads to fat deposition at the, kind of the back of the neck in what we call the buffalo hump. And then it also causes the um, face to get a classic moon-like appearance called moon face or moon faces. And they may, these may seem like even insulting terms, but they were initially descriptive because we didn't necessarily understand why these things were happening. And we just saw them in physical examination and these are the terms that we came up with. Having too much growth hormone leads to an interesting condition called acromegaly. So the way our bones work is they're designed to grow when, you're, when we're young, but then when we're done growing in our late adolescence, there's sort of a cap put on the bone called the epiphyseal plate. And if you start stimulating growth of your bones after that plate is in place, you end up with bone overgrowth in sort of an unusual pattern. And typically what happens with too much growth hormone is that the skull itself gets too thick and the brow becomes very heavy. Uh, the jaw gets thickened. You can also see this out in the bones in your hands and carpal tunnel syndrome can develop. And this also has a very classic appearance. It's subtle at first. People only really start to notice it when their face changes. And again, this can go by for many years very, very slowly before either the patient or their doctor realizes something is wrong. Having too much prolactin leads to spontaneous lactation. And this can happen in women who are not pregnant or breastfeeding. It can happen in men, which is obviously very alarming to the man. Um, and this actually is a very common sign um, for, um, for pituitary tumors. Uh, often, if they are producing hormones, prolactin is the hormone that they're, they're going to be producing. And finally, having too much follicle-stimulating hormone or luteinizing hormone interferes with our reproductive organs, and it can cause either premature menopause in a woman or very low testosterone levels in a man. And again, you know, some of these issues are, are very common in the population, and not all of them are classic uh, or definitive for MEN1. So you can see why uh, the poor physician who is seeing so many patients today in clinic uh, might not put all these clues together. It's sometimes only when you step back and really see the whole picture that it's obvious or suspected that MEN1 is present. So how do you get to the uh, pituitary gland? There's going to be a lecture devoted just to this, but just to uh, give an understanding in this one slide. Uh, I told you that the sinuses, the, the sphenoidal sinuses, are right kind of between your eyes, and then behind that is the little bony niche the pituitary gland sits in. So amazingly, surgeons who are much more skilled than I am can get there by going not through the top of the skull, but through that sinus to access the pituitary gland using tiny, tiny instruments. It's really quite remarkable. And again, you'll be hearing more about that later. There's also medical management that can be done for pituitary tumors that are overproducing hormone uh, using medicines like bromocryptine or cabergoline and other medicines, uh, the somatostatin analogs are sometimes used too, or triotide, uh, and you'll be hearing more about those. How do you assess the pituitary gland's appearance? Well, remember back in 1903, they were noticing these glands only during surgery or an autopsy. Well, thankfully today, we can look inside the body in a much less invasive fashion. An MRI or CT scan is a very good way to do that. MRI probably gives you just a little bit more detail in the area of interest, which is uh, right down here. So just to orient you to this picture, um, this is essentially a sideways view uh, of the brain. Uh, you can see actually the skull out here. This is the brain's uh, two lobes. And then down here is that little bony notch I was telling you about. This is that uh, optic nerve crossover point. This is a stalk that goes from the uh, gland above the pituitary, the hypothalamus, down to the pituitary. And the pituitary really should be sitting right down in this region right here. So MRI is a very nice technique for assessing this area and seeing if there's any abnormal growth. The other way that you can assess the pituitary gland function is through lab work. So really, you just do this by the hormone that you're interested in. So if a man comes to you and tells you he's lactating, that is not normal, and you should check a prolactin level. If the patient looks hyperthyroid, revved up, losing weight, having diarrhea, uh, 
then you can check either the stimulating hormone or levels of the thyroid hormone itself. So I always think of the pituitary gland as sort of the, the slave driver of the thyroid gland. So the pituitary sends down TSH and essentially flogs the thyroid into producing T3 and T4. In patients who are getting that strange growth of their bones long after adolescence, um, it's a little difficult to, to measure growth hormone, the responsible hormone, directly. Because in any of us throughout the day, growth hormone is actually released and goes up and down like a roller coaster. And you don't know when you test if you're catching them at a trough or at a peak. So what's a better thing to do is to, to test a related chemical called insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1. Or what you can try to do is you can see if you can suppress the growth hormone level way, way down by giving them sugar. So ordinarily, if you take in sugar, your growth hormone level should drop. If it doesn't, it tells you that you're overproducing growth hormone, and then you can make the diagnosis in that patient. The patient has the appearance that they've got too much of the stress hormone on board. If they're getting that uh, central fat deposition, the buffalo hump, or the moon face, there's various ways of checking that too. You can check the ACTH directly, but even then you might not know where it's coming from, and you want to be absolutely sure that it's coming from the pituitary gland and not from anywhere else in the body. So there's a couple of interesting tests that can be done to, to sort out the location of that hormone. You can do something where you give a steroid to the patient, a very powerful steroid called dexamethasone, at varying doses. And the bottom line is, if the, uh, the level doesn't go down with low-dose steroids, but does go down with high-dose steroids, you're suspicious that the source of the problem, again, is back in the pituitary gland. You can measure the stress hormone that's released over the course of 24 hours in the patient's urine. And a very sophisticated technique is to have an interventional radiologist or a surgeon actually thread measurement catheters up into the brain. They go through the vein. They end up at the veins that come out right by the pituitary gland. And you can actually measure this chemical right as it comes out of the pituitary gland. So we, we can do amazing things these days. So that's the pituitary. Now let's move down to the parathyroid gland. So this, again, sits at the base of the neck. It's normal functions to balance out your calcium level and your phosphorus level. And it's affecting calcium uptake and release in the kidney, in the gut, and from the bones, because the major storehouse of calcium in your body is your skeleton. It makes a chemical, which has got a great name, parathyroid hormone, so it's easy to remember, PTH. And it's essentially four glands located right around or behind the thyroid. That's how it got its name, parathyroid, around thyroid. A lot of people think their thyroid is up here. They feel their neck and they can feel this bump. That's, a car that's cartilage, and you actually want to kind of move your hand down and feel at the very base of your neck to get at your thyroid. And when you're having a physical examination in your doctor's office, sometimes they'll ask you to swallow, because that allows us to feel that tissue move up and down in your throat as you swallow. Now, the parathyroid glands are almost never palpable. They shouldn't be. And they're, they lie actually behind the thyroid most of the time. So for a surgeon to get in there, they actually have to raise up the thyroid, and then they, they remove uh, the parathyroid glands from, from behind there. How do you assess what the parathyroid is doing? Well, you can actually measure a lot of these things in the blood. You can measure parathyroid hormone, you can measure calcium, and you can measure phosphorus. You can also measure the amount of calcium that's released in someone's urine, again, over 24 hours. And I think you're already seeing the pattern that sometimes we, we measure things at just one point in time. Other times we go and we assess how things have been doing over 24 hours in the life of the patient. And sometimes with hormonal fluctuations, it's actually that longer data collection that gives you a more reliable answer. You can also do imaging of the parathyroid. And I'm actually going to show you some pictures of this. You can actually give the patient a radioactive isotope, which is safe, but which will be taken up preferentially by overgrowth in the parathyroid. And you can just do the kind of old-fashioned technique of taking an ultrasound probe, like you would use on a pregnant woman's belly, and putting it right over the, the thyroid and the parathyroid. So this is a parathyroid scan using that isotope I told you about. And this isotope, the name's not important, but it's called cestimimi, or technetium. And what happens is it's taken up uh, by the whole thyroid, but preferentially uh, by overgrowth in the in parathyroid, the, the adenomas. And then the um, thyroid gland itself should like to take up iodine. And so essentially what you do here is called subtraction. You take the, the first set of images where you're given the isotope. You subtract out the areas where the iodine is taken up. What you're left with is a somewhat vague but still pretty good sense that there's these darker circles here. And I realize this may look very, very fuzzy to you. This is why radiologists do what they do, because they're very good at interpreting these images. And you can see here that there's at least three areas where there was more cestimibi uptake than there was iodine uptake. And that indicates that in this patient, there's at least three parathyroid adenomas or growths. 
probably an easier way of, of seeing that is that we can now match this imaging to what we call cross-sectional imaging. This is a, sort of a fancy variation on a CT scan. You can actually see the patient here lying on the gurney. And now we're slicing them this way. So the MRI I showed you before, that was this way. Now we're going this way through the patient. We call that an axial image. And you can see here, this, this red spot, that's a hot spot in the parathyroid. So there's a lot, of, a lot of things that can be done in nuclear medicine to identify where exactly there's uptake in the parathyroid. And this is extremely helpful in allowing the surgeon to plan their operation. So how and when should you treat hyperparathyroidism in an MEM1 patient? So you should consider removing the parathyroids if the calcium level is greater than 11, if the patient's becoming osteoporotic, if they're developing these funny cystic tumors in their bones. Now the fancy term for this is osteitis fibrosis cystica, which is a mouthful for just about anyone. And really they're called brown cystic tumors in the bones. And this is literally a cross-section of a, a bone uh, in a patient that developed this condition. If the patient gets kidney stones, that's extremely uncomfortable manifestation of having high calcium. You should consider removing the problem. If their kidneys are failing because the calcium is too high and getting deposited in the kidney, that's a problem. And then interestingly, remember how all those patients in Wormer's first family were having problems with peptic ulcers? So that can actually come from having a high parathyroid hormone level too. For reasons that are a little bit mysterious, the parathyroid hormone itself can stimulate stomach acid production that's too exuberant. And they've done really elegant studies in animals where they've infused parathyroid hormone into the blood supply of the animal's stomach, and they can see the level of acid surge up. So sometimes if the MEM1 patient's having a hard time with stomach ulcers, before you go and assume that there's a problem in the pancreas with a gastronoma, uh, you may actually want to fix the problem with the parathyroids first. And that's not something that's evident to a lot of people and I think really um, has come about through a lot of specialty expertise. So here is the back view of the thyroid. So it's as if you're standing behind the patient looking forward at them and you can see these four tiny parathyroid glands hiding behind the thyroid tissue. And so when a, a surgeon does a subtotal uh, parathyroidectomy, they're generally removing three of these and just throwing them away. Sometimes they'll even remove a segment of the fourth one. But then the question is this. So in an MEN1 patient, their genes are such that for the rest of their life, whatever tissue is left behind the parathyroid is eventually going to become a problem again. And the patient's going to end up some years down the road with high calcium all over again. And then that becomes a surgical conundrum. So do you want to go and operate on the neck again, or would you rather operate in a more accessible area? Now this is completely up to surgical discretion, and there's a very nuanced reason for doing one or the other. But I just wanted to show you that sometimes they'll take that remnant tissue and they'll implant it in an easier to get to spot, like in the arm. So in this case, what would have happened is the surgeon would have taken out three of these glands, just thrown them away. And in that fourth one, they would have either taken a segment and thrown that away, and then they'd have taken the remnant or the whole gland and actually put it into the arm. And amazingly, um, if you do this uh, in a skillful manner, uh, there's enough uh, blood vessels that are uh, attached that it actually gets its own blood supply and then it becomes its own autonomous growth right there in your arm. It can be monitored pretty easily with ultrasound. And if it starts acting up, it's a little bit easier to operate or intervene on that spot in your arm than it is back in your neck. So, Again, various reasons why a surgeon would choose to do one or the other. There's no one way that's wrong or right in, uh, in dogmatic fashion. But just so that you're aware of this procedure, I think this is pretty remarkable. So what about that third P? What about the pancreas? So the main problem that we run into in MEN1, frankly, in terms of limiting both quality of life and, and length of life, is what's going on in the pancreas. It's not an organ where you want to have tumors. And there are various cells in the pancreas. Chiefly, the islet cells are responsible for hormone production. And depending which type of islet cell is affected, you get a different type of tumor. So just like when we were back in the pituitary, you could get different hormones. Same thing in the pancreas. There's different hormones that the pancreas is supposed to be producing. The one that we worry about, I think the most in MEN1, is something called the gastronoma. So gastrin is a hormone that ordinarily is there to help regulate your stomach acid production. And if you get an overgrowth of the cells in your pancreas that make gastrin, it's called a gastrinoma. And that's, that's a bad thing for two reasons, one of which you can get the bad stomach ulcers too. But number two, this type of islet cell tumor in particular can have malignant potential. So remember, all growths are not cancer. And we're going to talk about kind of the distinction of that vocabulary here in just a second. 
But cancer means something that's invasive and has a tendency to spread to other organs. And actually, that's what I deal with mostly in my, in my own specialty. And gastronomas have a nasty tendency to do that. So we worry the most in terms of malignant potential about gastronomas. Just under uh, them in terms of malignant potential is something called the glucagonoma. So most people are familiar with the pancreas and they know, well, if something goes wrong with my pancreas, I'm going to get you know, diabetes and I'm going to have a hard time controlling my blood sugar. Well, the pancreas has a built-in regulatory system where it makes both insulin to make your blood sugar go down and a counter hormone called glucagon actually makes your blood sugar come up. And if you have too much glucagon or a glucagonoma, then you're going to have trouble regulating your blood sugar. You also get this very nasty rash called necrolytic migratory erythema. That's a mouthful, sometimes abbreviated NME. And essentially, it's these funny, painful red patches that tend to develop over the lower half of the body. And to a dermatologist, because they have fantastic visual vocabulary, it's got a classic appearance. So almost any dermatologist should look at this and say, hey, I think that's necrolytic migratory erythema. We should be worried about glucagonoma here. But just so you're aware, that's another component of this particular tumor type. We talked about glucagon, so we have to talk about its, uh, its flip side, insulin. So if you have too much insulin in your body, your problem is not going to be that your blood sugar is too high, it's going to be that it's getting driven too low. And just like Linda was telling us earlier with you know, her insulin pump, if that gets off kilter, if you've got too much insulin coming out of your pancreas, you're going to have problems with low blood sugar. This can be particularly picked up if the doctor makes you fast. So sometimes they'll make you fast for 24, uh, 48, 72 hours, and they'll watch your blood sugars when you're not eating. And if you're not able uh, to regulate your blood sugars such that you can keep it up for that whole length of time, if you get really sweaty and you uh, need to have something to eat and that sweatiness goes away, that's, a, that's a, a key concern or clue that you might have an insulinoma. Something else called a VIPoma. Now, you guys are, are very important patients, but um, VIP actually stands for vasoactive intestinal peptide. And essentially what this does is it puts the accelerator down on how your intestines work. And if you've got too much VIP, you get this awful watery diarrhea. Another word for this is pancreatic cholera, just to emphasize how bad the diarrhea can be. And because in diarrhea you lose a lot of electrolytes like potassium, there's something called WADA syndrome, which is watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, or low potassium, and achlorhydria, meaning the pH of your stomach changes. So again, everyone in medical school learns that if someone comes in with profuse diarrhea and you can't find an infectious cause, you should have on your list of possible diagnoses VIPoma, but a lot of people will forget that over time. There's a drug called somatostatin, which I know at least one of you in the audience takes, and it's very commonly administered in uh, patients who have carcinoid syndrome, and essentially somatostatin is sort of a suppressive hormone for a lot of these other hormones that we're talking about. But you can actually have a tumor uh, that makes somatostatin itself, and because it puts the break on uh, your gastrointestinal tract, you can end up with problems uh, with gallstones. You can actually have difficulties absorbing food properly as it moves through your gut. And so this somatostatin excess can result in real difficulties with malabsorption. You end up with a lot of fat in your stools because you haven't been able to digest and absorb it properly in the small intestine. And then finally, you can have tumors in your pancreas which don't produce any hormones at all. And actually, these are, these are uh, perhaps the most common of the bunch is a non-functional tumor. So by none of the tests that we know how to measure hormones can we detect overproduction, and we just assume that the tumor is non-functional. Doesn't mean, unfortunately, that these aren't potentially worrisome or can't have malignant potential down the road if they get too big, but we can't see that there's a hormonal problem associated with the tumor being there. Related to the islet cell tumors, but just a little bit different in flavor, something called intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, or IPMN, and again, I'm trying to stay away, away from medical jargon as much as possible. But what you should know is that in MEN1 patients, if you see these abnormalities in the ducts of the pancreas, the way that the sort of juices get out of the pancreas, then those should be followed over time too, because these can be a precursor to the other type, the much more nasty type of pancreatic cancer, which is called pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So depending on where these are in the pancreas, whether they're in the middle or off to the side, depending on their size, uh, MEN1 patients can actually develop the traditional type of pancreatic cancer too. Uh, so another thing to unfortunately uh, follow and be concerned about. So what's the best way to look at the pancreas? You're going to get different opinions on this depending on where you go. Uh, I personally believe, and we've looked at this experience here at Mayo, that probably the best way to look at the pancreas in the MEN1 patient is to do something called an EUS. And this is a magnified version of an ultrasound probe on the end of a long flexible tube. 
So many of you have probably had endoscopies where the doctor has gone down with a flexible camera, fiber optic camera, and looked at your stomach or your small intestine. This is just like that, but with an added tool on the end of it. And what happens is the gastroenterologist will snake this all the way through the stomach and the small intestine until they're right next to the pancreas, because the pancreas comes right up next to the second part of the small intestine. And when they're there, they can actually twist and turn the ultrasound to get pictures. And the pictures look something like this. Now, a lot of people are only familiar looking at these in terms of pregnancies, so there's no boy or girl down here, okay? Uh, <laughs> what we're looking for instead is the pattern of shadows. And again, when you're first looking at these, they just look like a snowstorm. You can't tell you know, here or there what's going on. But these are specially trained gastroenterologists that know how to put the ultrasound probe in the right place and then twist and turn it so they get all sorts of pictures through that pancreas and they can see if there's tumors there. There's another type of imaging technique which is called an octrea scan. And that word somatostatin is going to come up again. So again, somatostatin is a natural hormone in the body. We can give it artificially with drugs like octreotide. But tumors that have a neuroendocrine origin, and some of these tumors we're talking about in the pancreas would fall into that category, um, will take up somatostatin. And we can actually exploit that in terms of both our diagnostics and our therapies. And what happens in an octrea scan is just like that isotope I told you about before where you can see the parathyroid growth. You can tag a radioactive isotope to somatostatin and give it to the patient. And then it'll go to all the organs that would ordinarily uh, take up somatostatin, but it'll also go to places where you wouldn't expect it. And that brightness, the br bright spot that I've circled here in red, is just such a spot in the head of the pancreas. So there are some organs here that we expect to be taking up somatostatin. So the liver is over here, the spleen is over here. But what's not expected is that bright spot. And I realize looking at this, again, it may just look like a Rorschach blot, but radiologists are good, and they can pick out what's abnormal here. So let me tell you briefly about another family. I already told you about Wormer's first family. So in this family, there was a 42-year-old man. He was a lifelong non-smoker, and he was in great health. And he went for essentially a pre-employment physical and got an x-ray. And the x-ray showed this. This is a large growth on the right side of his lung. And his past medical history, he had been having kidney stones since he'd been in his 20s. That was essentially the only thing of note. So this lung cancer was actually what we call an atypical bronchial carcinoid. It was not your run-of-the-mill uh, lung cancer. And this brings me to the point that although MEN1 is easy to remember because of the three Ps, the pituitary, parathyroid, and pancreas problems, there's a lot of other manifestations of the syndrome that sort of fly under the radar because they're not as easy to remember. They don't fit into that nice 3P midline mnemonic. So one problem that MEN1 patients can run into is carcinoid. Now, there's an interesting story behind this word. In 1907, there was a brilliant pathologist in Germany at the University of Munich called uh, Siegfried uh, Orbendorfer. And he was looking at the small intestine of patients, and he was seeing these tumors. And the tumors could get pretty big, and they could actually block off the intestine and cause big problems for the patients. But Orbendorfer, at first, didn't really think they looked like other cancers he had examined. And unfortunately, the word he chose to describe them was cancer-like, carzenoid in German. And that word has persisted ever since. For over a century now, this word carcinoid has been used to describe the appearance of these tumors that can arise uh, chiefly uh, in, the, in the gut, in the small intestine. But Orbendorfer himself realized 20 years later that he really should not have picked that word because these tumors can have uh, malignant behavior. And I told you before that there is a distinction between having a benign growth and something that's more invasive and can spread. And that's the line where we start calling something a cancer. So carcinoid patients, understandingly, will bristle at the notion that they don't have cancer. And it's just really unfortunate that Orbendorfer chose this name. And he himself regretted his choice. But the name lives on. There's even efforts nowadays to more properly refer to these as neuroendocrine tumors to get away from the carcinoid term. But it's very difficult. And, and I think that name's going to be with us for a while yet. So carcinoids can arise at different sites in the body. They can arise, just in this patient I told you about, in the lung or in the big airways in the lung called the bronchi. They can arise in the thymus. And so the thymus is a piece of immune tissue that's right up here at the top part of your chest. It's actually right below the parathyroids. And it's very important for our immunity when we're young, and then it actually regresses uh, as we get into young adulthood, and then it's really not very important for immune function after that. So sometimes, when patients are undergoing surgery to have their parathyroids removed, the surgeon will also, if it's accessible, remove the thymus in an MEN1 patient because that source of tissue can uh, lead to carcinoid development later on.
Because these tumors arise in the gut, uh, almost all of the gut from the stomach down to the top part of the rectum has blood that drains into the liver. And because of that, if they're going to spread through the bloodstream, uh, most often they end up uh, in the liver. Now, the liver is a fantastic filter. Ordinarily, it is uh, circulating uh, all the blood that comes from the, the intestine. It's getting rid of toxins and such. Um, and usually, if there's chemicals that are being produced by a carcinoid tumor, uh, they actually get filtered out by the liver. But if the carcinoid tumor spreads to the liver, it bypasses that filter. And at that point, the patient develops what we call carcinoid syndrome. So these chemicals that the liver was previously filtering out, the liver, it, it can't filter them anymore because the, the, the chemical production is happening in the liver itself. And carcinoid syndrome is again characterized by um, profuse uh, diarrhea. If that chemical gets into the circulation, gets up to the heart and lungs, it can thicken the valves in the heart, it can cause wheezing. So carcinoid syndrome is no joke. And again, I want to make it perfectly clear uh, that carcinoid really is, is a bad name for these type of tumors. And then finally, but rarely, these carcinoids can also develop in the reproductive organs in the ovary and the genitourinary tract. But really, uh, if, if I had to pick one group here to highlight in terms of their origin, uh, I would say it's the gut. Uh, the fact that this patient developed on the lung is, is a little bit more unusual. So let's, let's talk about how this patient did. So he actually had his entire right lung removed <coughs> and did great until three years later when unfortunately he developed some bad back pain and again, I'm not sure how well this will show up, but he actually had uh, cancer going to his spine. So again, just to emphasize that carcinoid is not always benign. And this required chemotherapy, but ultimately he, he passed away from his disease. Five years later, his uh, brother, his only brother, got headaches and visual changes. And remember how I told you that there can be sort of a classic pattern for visual loss. So uh, not to blind you with science, but this is called bitemporal hemianopsia. What that means is if you're looking behind the patient, looking through their eyes on the left and the right, they start losing vision out at their temples and moving in. And the reason for that is because there's a growth in the pituitary gland pushing up on the optic nerves as they're crossing over to send signals left and right to the other direction in the brain. And indeed, an MRI in his case revealed a very large pituitary mass. So this is what that area ought to look like. So just keep that in mind. And this is what his actually looked like. So there was a big tumor, and it was pushing up and compressing his optic or visual pathway. Uh, he underwent surgical removal for that. So that first patient, the gentleman unfortunately passed away. So 15 years uh, later, his son developed bad abdominal pain. And you can see here on just the basic x-ray, he's got terrible, terrible problems with, uh, with moving gas through his intestines. Indeed, his calcium level came back at 10.8. Two years before that, he actually had a problem where these uh, tiny one to three millimeter bumps had appeared over his nose. This maybe doesn't project well, very well, but then these tiny bumps here, they kind of look like acne, but they don't go away. And these are called by any astute dermatologist that we recognize angiofibromas. And this patient also had what's called lipomas, or benign fatty tumors. And again, those are very common in the population and by no means uh, classic for MEN1. But that patient is me. So the reason I have such an interest in MEN1 is selfishly that I have it myself. And as I was starting my training here, you know, I had bad abdominal pain, figured out I had a high calcium. And then all those lectures from medical school came back to me. And my father, who had passed away from this unusual lung cancer, when I started reading back through his medical records, I realized this is the type of lung cancer he had. And I really had to go back to my notes in med school and remember that MEN1 is not about just the three Ps. It's also about these unusual carcinoid tumors. So that's sort of how I put this whole picture together. So why is this happening to me? So I actually, I don't go around asking the why me question. I think I'm very uh, lucky in my life and I'm happy that I have this understanding. But for all of us that have MEN1, the problem is genetic. And what I, what I would um, emphasize to you here is, you know, you don't have to focus on my family history, but of the five men here, including myself, we all look different. We all have different manifestations. So even with the same mutation, uh, the disease can manifest differently. So this is clearly a work in progress. And right now, even if you're convinced a patient in front of you has MEN1 and you do the genetic testing, there's probably about 10 to 20% of people that are still going to fly under that genetic radar. We don't know exactly what's wrong with their genetic code. It hasn't been described well enough. So genetic testing is not perfect, but it's certainly better uh, even, ten, uh, even today than it was 10 years ago. It could be a new, previously undescribed mutation, or it could be a mutation somewhere completely different in the chromosomes which will bring me briefly in conclusion to the other types of multiple endocrine neoplasia.
So MEN1 is always a problem in this gene on chromosome 11 called menin. But MEN2, which is a completely different syndrome, is a defect elsewhere. It's on chromosome 10, and it affects a gene called RET. So one thing to emphasize is we don't entirely understand what menin does. We think it puts the break on growth that would otherwise develop in our endocrine glands. And when we lose that function through MEN1, that's why we end up with adenomas in our pituitary, our parathyroid, and tumors in our pancreas. RET is the opposite. Rather than being a break or suppressor, it's more like the gas pedal. And so this is a very different syndrome altogether than MEN1 because the manifestations tend to happen much, much earlier. There are MEN2 patients who will develop a very nasty form of thyroid cancer early in their life, which will merit consideration of removing the thyroid gland even in young children. So MEN1 and MEN2 are very, very different, much more different than their name and numbering would suggest. And I almost think it's unfortunate that they get lumped together because they, they, they are very, very distinct syndromes. MEN2A is this predisposition to this medullary thyroid cancer Adrenal tumors called pheochromocytomas, which are essentially packed with adrenaline, and then the same parathyroid problems we see in MEN1. MEN2B, which is also sometimes called MEN3, has the same issues with the adrenal and the thyroid, but a much more classic appearance, what's called a marfanoid appearance, where the, the fingers can get long, the face can have an unusual shape to it, they can get these very bumpy limp, uh, uh, lips and, and uh, bumps in the mouth. And actually, it's suspected, although not proven, that Abraham Lincoln might have had MEN2B. Uh, there's, uh, there's certainly some uh, uh, medical detectives out there who think that that was the case. Uh, and if you looked at pictures of him, he did actually have some bumps on his face, and he may have grown up his beard to, uh, to hide that. I don't know, but it's interesting. The new kid on the block is something called MEN4, which I know the geneticists will deal with soon. And that's, again, a defect in a completely different gene called cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor on chromosome 12. I don't think this is very well understood or described in humans yet, um, but it appears to be an overlap actually between MEN1 and MEN2. So it may, it may deserve its name uh, because you have the parathyroid problem. You have the same uh, issue in the thyroid with the cells that give rise to medullary thyroid cancer, and you can also have problems with growth in the pancreas. So MEN4 may really be an overlap between MEN1 and MEN2. But again, these are just names. These diseases are still very different, and we've got a long way to go to understand this one in particular. So what I would leave you with in summary is that the syndrome that Dr. Wormer described over 50 years ago still centers on the three Ps, uh, the pituitary, the parathyroid, and the pancreas. And management of any one patient is really dependent on their gland. Which gland is causing the problem? Is it a problem with hormone production, either too much or too little? Is it a problem with the size or location of the tumor? Are you worried the tumor is starting to become invasive or even spread elsewhere? And then that the inheritance will be 50-50 uh, from each affected parent. And so I'll leave you with a picture of my kids. This is my daughter, Emma. Uh, she's, uh, she's four, and she certainly uh, does represent my hope for the future. And then this is my son, Alan, who's now one. And I'm actually a perfect example of the 50-50 inheritance because she doesn't have it, and he does. And so. I think a lot of us are here not just for ourselves, but because we're worried our families will be affected by this. So I understand that very well, and I, uh, I'm so I'm thrilled that you're here and so pleased that you're interested in understanding the syndrome, again, uh, both for yourselves and for the generations that will follow you. So I'm going to close there and leave it open to any questions you might have. Thank you.